Amen. Thank you for praying, brothers. Good to see you. And uh, welcome back to those who are listening online to our evening service. We're grateful to the Lord to be able to uh, gather for an evening service like this and look at God's Word together. Uh, So with that, turn with me uh, to the book of Judges. It's been a little while since we've visited Gideon (laughs) in the book of Judges. And so we come again this evening to Judges chapter 6. Our text is verses 33 through 40. And the title of our sermon, Strength and Weakness. And when we last left Gideon, uh, Gideon has been called into service. Uh, The Israelites are under the iron fist of the Midianite menace. Uh, They have swept across the land seven years in a row now, uh, destroying the land, ruining crops, stealing cattle. And so the Israelites are impoverished, and they begin to cry out to the Lord. And the Lord answers by raising up another judge, and that is Gideon here in Judges chapter 6. And so we're going to continue to see how the Lord works through Gideon to prepare him to deliver his people in our text this evening. So let's look at Judges chapter 6, beginning in verse 33. Then all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east gathered together, and they crossed over and encamped in the valley of Jezreel. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and then he blew the trumpet, and the Abiezrites gathered behind him, and he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, who also gathered behind him, and he also sent mess- messengers to Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, and they came up to meet them. So Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand as you have said, look, I shall put a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece only, and it is dry on all the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand as you have said. And it was so. When he arose early the next morning and squeezed the fleece together, he wrung the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. Then Gideon said to God, Do not be angry with me, but let me speak just once more. Let me test, I pray, just once more with the fleece. Let it now be dry only on the fleece, but on all the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night. It was dry on the fleece only, but there was dew on all the ground. This is the word of God. Amen. Amen. Let's pray, and then we'll study this text together. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for this book, uh, the book of the Judges, and uh, the history of your gracious and merciful deliverance of your people time and time and time again. Uh, What a triumphant testimony this is of your patience, your long-suffering, your grace, and your mercy, and how Uh, Even when we, Lord, especially when we do not deserve it, you are faithful to your word, faithful to your covenant. And we rejoice, Lord, to worship this uh, testimony of who you are in this book. Uh, This book, Lord, also shows us uh, very clearly our own sin, the condition of man, and the depths to which we have fallen. And we uh, praise your grace, Lord, praise you for your mercy toward us, and pray, Lord, that you'd be merciful to us now in having saved us in the Lord Jesus Christ by faith, uh, through faith, by grace, and uh, trusting Him alone. Lord, I pray that You would now sanctify us, uh, build our faith, uh, show long-suffering with us, Lord, now in in Christ as we seek to worship You and to serve You and obey You. Uh, We are grateful that in Christ we can come to You and pray in faith, Uh, trusting and resting in your promises and trusting and resting in your word, knowing, Lord, that you are faithful. Uh, Be with us now, Lord, as we study, as we seek to learn of you, and, Lord, seek to serve you fervently and devotedly. We love you. We thank you for this time. Uh, Thank you for my brothers and sisters here, those listening at home. Pray, Lord, that you'd bless our time in your word this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, strength in weakness, Judges chapter 6, verses 33 through 40. As we consider this text together, the Lord delights to demonstrate His power through our weakness. The Lord delights to demonstrate His power through our weakness. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27, Paul says that God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. In that text in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul gives us the reason why God chooses to do that. And it's for the purpose that no flesh 
should glory in his presence. Now, when Paul there in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 is speaking of weak things, Paul is speaking of us, uh, those whom God has chosen. He has chosen the weak things, us, of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. We are the weak ones. Now, we know in our day and age that many profess to be strong. Many profess to be strong, uh, and it's uh, a virtue day to, today to consider yourself to be a strong person, you know, a strong woman, a strong man, mentally strong. Some even appear uh, by worldly standards to be strong, physically strong, mentally strong, intellectually strong. However, the opposite, exactly the opposite is true. We are dramatically and devastatingly weak. We are made of dust. Our outward man is decaying. We're like the grass that withers or the flower that fades. James says that our lives are like a vapor that appear, appears for just a little while and then vanishes away. Paul later in 2 Corinthians would refer to us as clay pots. Clay pots, fragile, cracked, easily broken, common. We're not made of gold dust. We're made of dirt, right? Dust of the earth. Not gold dust, but dirt. We're powerless against death, powerless to save ourselves, powerless in sin to ascend to any good, to ascend to any righteousness. Destruction and misery are in our ways. Altogether, Paul says, we've become unprofitable. Unprofitable. Despite that fact, and if you meditate on that for just a moment, you know that it is a fact <laughs> how weak we are. Despite that fact, we are astonishingly prone to pride, astonishingly, astonishingly prone to self-reliance. We're prone to self-exaltation. Fallen man races to glory in God's presence, races to glory anywhere else but in God's presence, racing to glory against God. A fallen man races to glory. Even Christians, even us, uh, those of us who are called even Christians are so often, you know, to our shame, we confess that, we're shamefully so often given over to pride and self-reliance. And in pride and self-reliance, our faith is often so weak. We're quick, quick to take matters into our own hands. We fail to acknowledge or believe that we are in His hands and we want to take matters into our own hands when we are weak. And so God, being gracious, being merciful, being patient and long-suffering with us, God takes the good and necessary steps that He must to humble us. And that humbling of His people is designed to grow their faith. And in humbling us, God is very patient with us, long-suffering with us. Now, very often, that process of growth, <laughs> that process where God humbles us as His people, is a painful process. It's not pleasant. It doesn't feel good. Uh, he has to show us how weak we, we really are. And often, He shows us that in adversity, in difficulty, in trial. But the Lord is gracious. He's far more interested in our humility than he is in our comfort. Humility depends upon him, and that's exactly where we need to depend, right? Humility worships him. Humility places reliance and places gratitude and places devotion and places worship where it belongs. That places it with him. In that way, when God humbles us, God glorifies His grace, glorifies His mercy, glorifies His patience, and glorifies His strength, His power in our sight. And when God does that, it's good for us, right? It's always good for us. Why? Because we are weak and He is our strength. It's always good for us, and we need to see that. Rather than cultivating a reliance upon our own strength, which is non-existent, we are made to see how weak we are. It's often that God gives us enough rope to hang ourselves, so to speak, to see how weak we are so that His strength and His power is made perfect, the Bible says, or affirmed or fully revealed in our weakness so that we would trust in Him where our trust belongs, right, and obey His Word. Our most pressing need is not personal strength. 
Our most pressing need is not self-esteem or self-reliance. Our most pressing need is to heap contempt on our pride. That's our most pressing need. To abandon our hope in ourselves and to put all our faith in Him alone as our strength. And then to say with the psalmist, The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in Him and I am helped. The chief evidence or illustration of this fact is the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. To the world, in the eyes of the world, he is weak. He's a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, he is the Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Great power seen in what the world would say is weakness. In our text this evening, we see Gideon in great need of learning this very lesson. This very same lesson. And as Gideon learns this lesson in Judges chapter 6, we need to remember this lesson in Judges chapter 6. Uh, let us learn it in Judges chapter 6 so that we might have to learn it less in the school of hard knocks later. Right? Let's heed the lesson that we learn here from Gideon in Judges chapter 6. Now, as Gideon begins to learn the lesson, we see both God's power and God's patience God's power on display as our source of strength in verses 33 through 35, and then God's patience with our weakness, verses 36 through 40. In both ways, God is so immeasurably gracious and merciful and long-suffering with us. So God's power, God's patience. First, consider with me God's power in verse 33. Then all the Midianites and the Amalekites, the people of the east, gathered together they crossed over and encamped in the valley of Jezreel. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. Then he blew the trumpet, and the Abiezrites gathered behind him. And he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, who also gathered behind him. He also sent messengers to Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, and they came up to meet them. Now to put this event in context... We have to remember that Gideon's weak. We've seen his weakness displayed in the text, right? In fact, the entire nation of Israel is devastated by impotence in the face of the Midianite menace. Gideon is fearful, discouraged. He's without hope. The people, fearful, discouraged, without hope. And remember the story. The Midianites would come in once a year. For seven years, they've been going through this. The Midianites would swarm in, take their crops, take their cattle. The Israelites would scramble into the hills and the caves, hiding out. And in chapter 6, verse 6, the Lord describes Israel as greatly impoverished. In other words, small in number. They're weak. They're physically weak. The angel of the Lord comes to Gideon, chapter 6, verse 11. And what do we find Gideon doing? Gideon is hiding out in the wine press, threshing wheat, hiding there for fear of the Midianites. The Lord comes to him. The angel of the Lord comes and says, mighty man of valor. And he calls them that for what he's about to do. At the moment, though, he's not there yet. God has a work to do in Gideon, and we'll see that as we go. Now, what's the reason for their weakness, great weakness? What's the reason? The nation, including Gideon's own family, is steeped in idolatry, worshiping worthless idols. Now, what we find then is a physical weakness, a physical fear, a physical impotence that depicts or points to a devastating spiritual weakness. In other words, the spiritual weakness of the people, the spiritual impotence of the people, undergirds or causes the physical weakness of the people. Uh, it depicts or points to a devastating spiritual weakness. They were spiritually impoverished, and so they were far more than physically impoverished. They were malnourished, you could say. And Gideon here is no picture of faith. There are many who would preach this text, right, and hold up Gideon as a, as a picture of faith or hold up Gideon's faith as commendable. There's nothing commendable about Gideon's faith here. Gideon is faithless. Gideon is unbelieving. Gideon is a picture of unbelief. That which would have strengthened him, that which would have sustained them, faith in the Lord, communion with the Lord, the appointed means of grace, worship of God, all that has been set aside, neglected, all that has been abandoned, and now in its place, a cancerous tumor is growing. 
gain green is setting in and the people have become impoverished. Now, the same is true of you. Same is true of me. If we neglect those means by which God intends to strengthen and sustain you, if we neglect those means, we neglect our own spiritual health. We, dis, dis, we neglect or abandon our own source of strength and nourishment. And we become impoverished, small, maybe even the host of something deadly. It'll cause you to stunt your growth. <laughs> You'll find yourself not growing. You'll find yourself languishing. You'll find yourself on a regular basis in conflict. Find yourself not understanding. Find yourself weak. As the Bible says that many of you by now should be teachers, we could also say that it would be biblically appropriate that by now anyone who's been here for any length of time should be strong, should be maturing and growing and healthy. God is so gracious to provide us with everything that we need to be growing and thriving and healthy and strong and running and obedient and faithful and full of faith in our Christian walk. The Lord provides us everything that we need. And yet, through the neglect of those means that God intends to strengthen and sustain you, you find yourself impoverished and weak. And oftentimes, there are those that are childish, unable to digest meat, only able to take milk, maybe even the host of something deadly, like the seeds of apostasy. We need to take care, take care with the means that God has given us and not receive the grace of God in vain. By the time the Lord comes to Gideon here, Gideon is ready to acknowledge his own weakness, ready to acknowledge the weakness of the nation, right? He sees his physical weakness. He understands it. Chapter 6, verse 15. So he said to him, said to the angel of the Lord, O oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And look at chapter 6, verse 15 of what the Lord has done. God has chosen the weakest man from the weakest clan. The Lord delights to demonstrate his power through our weakness, doesn't he? The Lord's going to do that. Well, here we are again. Here we are again. Verse 33 then. All the Midianites, all the Amalekites... The people of the east, they're once again, they've swept in across the land. They're all encamped in the Jezreel Valley. Jezreel Valley is in the north of the country, sort of southwest of the Sea of Galilee. In seven years, they've been doing this. They spread out like locusts, the Bible says, the enemies of God's people. It's interesting, oftentimes the enemies of God's people gather together in this valley, the valley of Jezreel. Uh, that was under Barak. They gathered there in the valley of Jezreel. Revelation 16, this is where the battle of Armageddon is going to be. The hill at Megiddo is here in the Jezreel valley. Now, the enemies of God's people gathering here again. The Midianites are there. The people who had joined with the Moabites to curse Israel in Numbers 22 led the people of Israel into sin. The Amalekites are here. The people who attacked Israel from their rear guard in Exodus as they came out of, as they came out of Egypt, uh, people that God is particularly uh, despising. And the people of the east are there also here encamped in the Jezreel Valley. They've taken over. Now remember, remember, this is the land that the Lord has given to His people. And here these enemy usurpers have taken up residence in this land. If his people had trusted the Lord, if they had obeyed his voice, then they would be occupying this land free and clear. But they've not obeyed his voice. And now there are enemy invaders in the heart of Israel uh, wreaking havoc on his people. There's a spiritual counterpart to all of this reality. A spiritual counterpart to all of it, isn't there? They let the enemy in the front door. Or you could say in, their, in going into the land that God had given them, they didn't drive out the enemy as they were commanded to. They didn't obey God's word. And so they let the enemy camp out there. Let the enemy stay. Now the enemy has multiplied. The enemy has become a snare. And now foreign enemies are swarming into Israel, uh, taking 
uh, what they've, the hard work that they've done, raise their crops. Uh, the enemy has now become a spiritual snare, a physical snare, and always a snare to Israel. But this time around, something is different. Look at verse 34. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. Then Gideon blew the trumpet, the Abiezrites gathered behind him. Literally, the Spirit of the Lord was clothed with Gideon. It's an interesting word there in the Hebrew. Many interpret this to mean that the Spirit of the Lord was draped upon Gideon as a garment, like a cloak, and it wouldn't necessarily be wrong to think of that, that the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. But the grammar here actually suggests that the Spirit of God took upon himself Gideon as a garment. In other words, the Spirit possessed Gideon. <laughs> the Spirit possessed Gideon. God has now, by his Spirit, empowered Gideon, clothed Gideon with the Spirit, or the Spirit is clothed now, you could say, with Gideon. God has equipped Gideon to do what God has called him to do, and God is now at work through Gideon. Gideon blew the shofar, the trumpet, that ram's horn, and Gideon goes from trembling to trumpeting. <laughs> That's by the power of God, by the power of his Spirit, from timid to trumpeting. And the Abiyah's rights, who were the Abiyah's rights? The Abiyah's rights were Gideon's own family. Now remember from a sermon a couple of weeks ago that Gideon's family, his clan, were the very ones who were offering sacrifices to Baal at an offer, at an altar, and had an Asherah pole set up beside it. Gideon was told to go in and tear down that altar, tear, tear down that Asherah pole, and the Abiyah's rights were the ones who wanted to kill Gideon for doing it. And here, they're the very ones who now rally to Gideon at the blowing of the trumpet. It's all because of Gideon's magnetic personality, isn't it? Gideon had such charisma. They just, no, it's not doesn't have anything to do with any of that. It's because the Spirit of God is empowering Gideon and is at work in this circumstance. They all rally to Gideon at the blowing of the trumpet. Certainly, there was the Spirit, and now Spirit-empowered proclamation going on as well. Look at verse 35. And Gideon sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, who also gathered behind him. He also sent messengers to Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, and they came up to meet them. First, he calls, and his own tribe, Manasseh, responds. Then all the tribes in the north, Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, all those tribes near where the enemy has gathered now in the Jezreel Valley, and all these formerly impotent, powerless, weak, spiritually malnourished Israelites gather now at the call of Gideon. It's all because of a work of the Spirit of God, right? All because God is at work. In God's power, through God's Spirit, Gideon becomes a powerful herald. <laughs> Spirit-empowered proclamation, he gives the message, spirit-empowered leadership, and when it seems just moments ago that the circumstances were utterly hopeless, Israel is tramping off back into the hills and caves, now the people are responding. Why is that? It's because God is at work. In other words, this is the picture of God's power. God can do anything He wants to do in this circumstance, and if you think about it, in order to demonstrate his power, God is bringing this circumstance about. He brought the Midianites, the Amalekites, the people from the east into that valley so that his power might be shown through them, right? He did that with Pharaoh. He's doing it again now in the Jezreel Valley. God is sovereign. God is reigning, and we see God's power at work. Why would we ever be faithless? Right? How many times have you seen his power at work in your own life, in our circumstances, here at this church? Many, 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 many times we've seen God in power at work. Now Gideon, the judge, appears now, finally, appears now to be ready for battle. Right? He blows the trumpet, he sends for the tribes to come. He's proclaimed the Lord's promised victory, certainly. All the people now are gathered around him. He has an army now at his disposal. Certainly now he has the confidence to trust the Lord. Like he'll trust the Lord and obey him? No, <laughs> he doesn't. It's amazing, isn't it? Gideon continues to doubt. He doubts right up to the very brink of battle. Gideon's faith in the Lord is simply 
weak, simply weak. And we can think, like, we remember the story of Moses, right? Or we see in the New Testament the example that comes to mind is Peter, often how um, we're weak (laughs) and we don't trust in the Lord. And the Lord would be just and would be right, wouldn't he, to just, okay, I'm not going to use you any longer. I'm going to pass over you, or I'm going to consume you, and I'm going to make of some other guy a great nation, right? The Lord would be right in doing that, but he doesn't do that. Um, the Lord is patient in, display, in, in continuing to delight to display his power through our weakness. God also delights to magnify his patience or his long-suffering with us. We see God's power. Look at God's patience, his patience. Verse 36, so Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand as you have said, you notice that? Gideon says, look, I shall put a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there's dew on the fleece only and it is dry on all the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand as you have said. Now notice those words, as you have said. Gideon's here putting, is putting conditions on God. God's already said. It's as you have said. God has said already that this is what he's going to do. But then Gideon begins to put conditions on God. Well, God, if you will, verse 36, then I shall, verse 37. Gideon is the one here who is running the show, so to speak? No. He acknowledges this as the word of God, as you have said, as you have said, and yet he doesn't believe it. And reading this, you know, you'd have to expect the ground to open up under Gideon's feet and swallow him alive into the pit at this point where he stands. But God doesn't do that. God doesn't do that. And it is a a miraculous, a glorious testimony of God's patience, God's long-suffering, God's compassion, God's pity. Right? God pities us in our weakness. If you're in Christ, God looks upon you in pity and delights in helping and growing and maturing our faith, delights in coming to our aid, delights in showing himself strong through our weakness. Miraculous grace, miraculous mercy, miraculous patience. What does God do? God, what does God do here? God fulfills Gideon's request. Look at verse 38. And it was so. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? Absolutely amazing. And it was so, verse 38. When Gideon arose early the next morning, squeezed the fleece together, he wrung the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. Okay, okay, okay. That's enough, Gideon. <laughs> That's enough, right? Get on with it. Notice, this is not a picture of faith. You can't preach a sermon commending Gideon's faith at this point. This is a picture of unbelief. It's a picture of faithlessness. You're not really entitled to preach a sermon here on this text about how to find God's will. You can't do that from this text. This is not a text about how we find God's will. How many of us have at one point or another in our Christian background have thought about it that way, right? Uh, and I want to know what God's will is in this circumstances. I need to, you know, proverbially, I need to lay out a fleece. No, you, this is, that's not what this text is about. <laughs> You're not going to find a sermon here about how to find God's will. God's will is clear here to Gideon. As you have said, God has clearly laid it out. Gideon already clearly knew the will of God. As you've said, Gideon simply needs to trust and obey. Now, truth be told, that's often, to our shame, the way that it is with us. We can think to ourselves, I really want to know what God's will is in this circumstance. When God's will is very clear in his word, we need to go to his word to understand and to apply and obey the will of God as it has been revealed to us. We often don't do that. Why? Because we're self-willed, or we're weak, or we're faithless. God's word here to Gideon in particular is abundantly clear. God's word here is sufficient for Gideon. God's word here is given directly to Gideon. It's not mincing words. It's very clear. And what is happening here, what's going on in Gideon's heart and mind is not commendable. This is because Gideon here lacks faith. So much so that he now changes the conditions of the test. You know what? That's, that's, now that I think about it, it seems like it may be a little too easy, right? The fleece is designed 
to soak up water, and so the dew's going to fall. It would be sort of natural that there wouldn't be any dew on the ground. It's all going to be soaked into the fleece. And so, Lord, you know, I just want to listen. I want to make sure. I, what you've told me, I just want to make sure, you know. And he changes the conditions of the test. Look at verse 39. Then Gideon said to God, do not be angry with me, but let me speak just once more. Let me test. Look at the use of that word, test. Let me test, I pray, just once more with the fleece. Let it now be dry only on the fleece, but on all the ground let there be dew. How did the Lord respond? Verse 40. And God did so that night. Amazing patience. He accommodates Gideon. He pities Gideon. He comes alongside Gideon. He wants to help Gideon build. It's just the patience of God, the grace and mercy, the compassion of God, right? God did so that night, verse 40. It was dry on the fleece only, but there was dew on all the ground. Absolutely amazing. God, with immeasurable patience, allows Gideon to test him these two times. Gideon's use of that word test, it's interesting the use of that word. It puts what Gideon is doing, think with me, it puts what Gideon is doing in the same category with what the Israelites were doing in the wilderness when they tested God. Remember when they tested God at Rephidim in Exodus 17 with the water, right? And they tested God again in the wilderness when they were uh, supposed to go in, obey the Lord, trust the Lord, and go in and take the promised land. They continued to test God again and again and again. Here, God, very patient with Gideon as Gideon tests the Lord. God is patient, but not only patient, God exceeds expectations in his pity here that he shows to Gideon. The test one, that all the, dry, the ground be dry all around. Let there be dew only on the fleece. And so God answered as requested, but soaked the fleece such that Gideon wrung a bowl full of water out of that fleece. Right? Exceeded what Gideon asked for, had asked for. Test two, entirely unnatural. Let the ground be soaked and let the fleece be dry. And yet God does exactly that. God continues to condescend in dealing with Gideon's weak faith. It magnifies the patience of God. God doesn't have to, but he so often does. God condescends in patience. God condescends in love, in mercy, in compassion. God condescends to care for us or to reassure us in our fear. He is patient with our weakness. He humbles himself as he humbles us, doesn't he? He humbles himself to bolster a fragile, fledgling faith, to strengthen our confidence in his word. He often does that with us. And if you think about that in terms of our relationship with him as our heavenly father, a father who cares for us and gives us good things. What earthly father? When some, his child comes and asks for bread, he gives him a stone. No, an earthly father desires to do good to us. How much more our heavenly father? I mean, think about maybe the illustration of uh, your child. I've got two daughters, obviously, and uh, one of my daughters, I remember uh, being in the pool, right? And as they're standing on the edge of the pool and they've got the floaties on, not only have the floaties on, they've got the thing around their waist. There's no way they're going down. No way they're going down. But they're standing on the edge of the pool and fearful about jumping in. And you're standing in the pool holding your arms out, wanting them to jump, right? And when they, you know, when they say no or they're scared, they're not going to jump, you don't reach out and rip them by the ankle into the water and say, how dare you not trust? Right? No, you don't. <laughs> That's not the way you deal with them, right? You, you're patient with them. You love them. You care for them. You bear long with their weakness. That's how God is with us. Uh, we must trust him. We can trust him even more than your child with the floaties on and the thing around their waist and dad sitting in the water. We can trust our Heavenly Father who cares for us and pities us and shows compassion toward us and is gracious and merciful toward us. We see so many examples of this in the Bible. Right? One of the, the, the examples that I love uh, and just treasure every time I come to read about it is the illustration of the disciples. The disciples are in the, up the upper room with the Lord Jesus Christ, John 13, 14, 15, you know, and 
The Lord is, is um, about to be crucified. He's going to his death. And what is he doing in the upper room? He's reassuring those men. Um, they don't know what is about to happen. Their world is about to be rocked. And what is the Lord doing on the eve of his death? The Lord is there reassuring them. Uh, don't let your heart be troubled. Right? Don't let your heart be troubled. Reassuring them, taking time with them. After the Lord is crucified, you know, uh, before the Lord was crucified, Peter denies him three times. We see the weakness of the disciples. They all flee as a sheep uh, are scattered without a shepherd, and Peter denies him. Uh, the Lord then is raised from the dead in power and comes back and uh, is seen by the disciples. Um, and he's there again, bolstering their faith. The, the disciples are locked in a room for fear of the Jews, and the Lord comes in the midst of them and says, peace be with you, right? Cares for them, is patient with their weakness, patient with their uh, fledgling faith, you could say, and wanting to build them up and mature them and grow them and strengthen their faith. He patiently restores, patiently builds them up. And then we see Lord Jesus Christ on the beach with Peter, right? Taking care with Peter. Peter, do you love me? If Peter denies him three times, the Lord asks him that question three times. Right, Peter, do you love me? Tend my sheep, feed my sheep, tend my sheep. It's just the, the care and the love and the compassion and the pity, uh, the mercy of our Lord. It's just uh, a glorious uh, truth that we can rest in and hope in and trust in and live in and work in and serve in and obey in. Those same disciples who were fearful and fled, the Lord told them, you wait in Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Acts 1.8, right? remember, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, same city that crucified the Lord. You'll be witnesses there to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost ends of the earth. And those disciples, those same fearful, weak faith men go right back into the city, the city that crucified the Lord and preach the gospel boldly. It's amazing, a testimony of God's power at work in and through them and God's patience with them as he grows and cultivates and develops their faith. The Lord will do, do the same through you and I. We just need to trust him. We need to believe in Him. We need to follow Him in faith and obey Him and listen, pour ourselves into His Word and let Him work through His Word to change our hearts, change our mind. We need to believe what He says. Take Him at His Word. You know, as we do, faith very often doesn't mean the absence of fear. It's trust in the face of fear. There's going to be fear. There's going to be difficulty. There's going to be adversity. Faith doesn't mean that you're fearless all the time. There's going to be fear. Faith simply involves trusting the Lord in the face of fear, trusting Him. And God is patient. God is kind. God is loving, compassionate with us. As He works in us, as He works through us, in power to do His will. And in power to to build and to grow our faith, to strengthen our faith, to strengthen our hand, to walk with us as we go through difficulty and adversity and trials. And we just need to trust the Lord. It's the lesson that Gideon is learning in Judges chapter 6. It's the lesson that we need to learn as we consider that text together tonight. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul is suffering under the, the grip, if you will, of a trial, a weakness, a messenger of Satan sent to buffet him, uh, to keep him humble, as the Lord has said. Well, the Lord, after Paul prays three times to have it removed, the Lord says to him, my grace is sufficient for you because my strength is made perfect in weakness. Paul says, responding in faith then, doesn't he? Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. My brothers and sisters, may the power of Christ rest upon us as we trust in him. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, uh, we rejoice, Lord, to see you as preeminently 
infinitely worthy of our trust, worthy of faith. And so, Lord, now we believe in you, Lord. We put our faith and trust in you. Help our unbelief. Help us, Lord, in our weakness. Hold us by the hand, Lord, and walk us through difficulty. Walk us through adversity. Grow and mature our often weak and fragile faith. Help us, Lord, to learn to trust in you completely. Strengthen us, Lord, that we might be strong in your power, that your power may be magnified, that your grace and mercy may be magnified in our weakness. And let us with Paul then rejoice, <laughs> boast in our affirmities so that the power of Christ may rest upon us. We love you, Lord. We thank you for how patient you are with us, how gracious and how merciful you are with us, how compassionate you are with us. Thank you, Lord, for how uh, so what, just such a good heavenly Father you are to us. Help us, Lord, as we serve you. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.